All right, let's go to our um, Bible lesson. I'm going to have you turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to take on a, a section that's awkward for a lot of people. However, I don't think it should be. Let's read verses 1 through 6 today. Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now let's go back over this section, and we'll line up the factors as they appear for us in the authorized Bible. First of all, whoever is being addressed is in the same boat as the writer, who we believe is Paul. He says there in verse 1, uh, let us go on unto perfection, etc. The person is being told to leave something on the grounds that it is milk and not meat. We talked about this last week. Uh, verse 1, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And we discussed this at some length, the difference between a baby Christian or new Christian who needs milk to grow and get started and someone who ought to know much more and can handle deeper subjects. Um, he has laid a foundation and he's being told not to lay it again, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, etc. He's told to go on with God unto perfection, uh, or he may not go on. Verse 3 says, and this will we do if God permit. If he does not go on, then something is an impossibility for him. Verse 4, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and so forth, if he does not go on, then he cannot be renewed again unto repentance, verse 6, and he is rejected, later in verse 8, whose end is to be burned. And the voice changes from us, verse 1, to those, verse 4, and then back to you, later in verse 9. This has caused the linguists and the Greek-loving scholars to scramble, trying to find a proper understanding of this whole section of the Bible. And uh, several kinds of interpretations are put forth. The old-time Pentecostals, as well as Methodists, and Episcopalians, and the even Roman Catholics, and uh, Seventh-day Adventists, and other groups, uh, the Assemblies of God, have this as a man who is genuinely saved, but he must endure to the end and not fall away, or else he's in danger of losing his salvation. The Roman Catholic position would be someone who dies who is not in a state of grace at the time he dies. He hasn't been to church in a while. He hasn't taken the uh, Holy Communion or the sacrament as they have it. And most of those groups, however, think that a person can get it back again if he repents and he cleans up his act before he dies. However, Verses 4, 5, and 6 in this section would indicate that you can't get it back. The old Schofield Reference Bible likens this person in the text to a Jewish spy, to the Jewish spies back in Numbers 13 and 14, Deuteronomy 1, the Jewish spies who went into the Promised Land and came back and they gave a report of how good it was. They brought back clusters of grapes and even pomegranates and figs 
um, and, and described how good it was to Moses and the people, but then didn't believe God in order to, for that, so that God could give them the land. They turned back, as the Schofield note says. Schofield calls him Jewish professed believers who advanced to the very threshold of salvation, but then, quote, they halt short of faith in Christ. As think of someone who, who wasn't saved to start with. He's been under conviction about getting saved, but for some reason he can't bring himself to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Christ alone in order to be saved. His stubbornness has prevented him from trusting Christ completely. Now, there are several holes in this uh, in this exposition. First of all, no, none of the spies back in Kadesh Barnea uh, had been made partakers of the Holy Ghost, as they're described here in verse 4. Not one spy had been grounded in the principles of the doctrine of Christ, as verse 1 states it. Uh, none of them had tasted of any heavenly gift, as verse 4 states. If they had eaten the grapes, and so forth, that would at least be an earthly gift, but that's not the same thing as a heavenly gift. And we never read that they were burned, like verse 8 warns, for not entering into the land, uh, nor were any of them said to be nigh unto cursing, whatever other problems they may have had. Beyond this, it's also very taxing to think of lost Hebrews partaking of the Holy Ghost, tasting of the heavenly gift, plus the good word of God, verse 5, and the powers of the world to come. You know, the world to come is the millennial reign. We talked about that earlier, right back in uh, Hebrews 2, verse 5, and uh, Ephesians 1, verse 21. So the world to come has a, is a reference to the millennium of the Jews, and it's hard to think of a Jew with all of those elements, who still doesn't believe. Now, um, there's a third uh, approach to understanding this section, and that's by um, the late Dr. M. R. De Haan. He died in 1965, before I was old enough to hear him on the radio, but he had been raised in the uh, Dutch Reformed Church, born of uh, Dutch immigrant parents, uh, but then through the Schofield Reference Bible became a premillennialist and began preaching uh, powerfully and had a, a great following, the radio Bible class, which I believe still operates today, but it would not without the same spirit and power as it was when he preached. And uh, he was convinced that the King James Bible was the perfect word of God, no need to change it. That's one good thing about him. Um, but he conjectured that it wasn't people who would be burned, but only things uh, which were unprofitable. And this was because of verse 8. Look at verse 8 in our text. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing. Whose end, whose? So it is a person whose end is to be burned. I want you to turn back to the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, the last chapter of the Old Testament. And uh, Dr. DeHaan compared this with um, works uh, of a Christian that were like wood, hay, stubble, things which would be burned in the uh, judgment of God, 1 Corinthians 3. But Malachi chapter 4, and notice there, first of all, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And then verse 6. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So, 
um, the last words in the Old Testament warn about the, uh, the, uh, the future judgment of Christ in the millennium on all those who rejected him during the tribulation just preceding it. And they would have a curse upon them and be burned up. That's not to be taken figuratively or metaphorically. Uh, everybody wants to say that the idea of hell is simply a, a euphemism, a metaphor for separation from God one day. But uh, you, could, you could describe separation from God a lot of ways without using hell as the imagery and fire as the imagery. So we take it to be literal. And um, all sorts of interpretations concerning Hebrews 6 lean in one of these three directions. Either it's someone who had it, some Christian who has it, uh, or had it and then lost it, and or it's simply the things that are unprofitable in a Christian's life that will be burned up, uh, or it is someone who hears about it and he comes real close to believing but doesn't quite believe all the way. And on top of it, <clears throat> the Greek lovers try to twist the meaning of the word taste. Um, taste of the heavenly gift, verse 4, uh, were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted of the good word of God, the powers of the world to come, uh, to mean that they heard about it uh, or were persuaded intellectually about it, but still refused to believe it in their heart. Um, and this is, uh, this interpretation of the word taste is ruined by the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, let's go back to John chapter 8. John 8, and we'll start there at verse 51. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Here, um, if someone tastes of death, it means they die. They experience it. And um, if to taste meant only to hear about death, then Christ should have corrected their misstatement. But he did not. And the same Greek word for taste um, is used throughout the New Testament, including Hebrews chapter 6. So to taste means to experience something. And the truth is, this part of the book of Hebrews can only be properly understood or interpreted by applying it to the future, not to the church age right here and now. Otherwise, you're going to have a whole multitude of approaches and interpretations People thinking the Greek might shed light. People thinking, well, that word was translated wrong by the King James translator, so maybe we'll find light there. Or it means somebody who hears about the, the things God wants to do for them and uh, then says, yeah, but I don't want it anyway. And uh, all kinds of mixed interpretations. Uh, or someone who has it and then it, it is, loses it if he doesn't hang on to it tightly enough. But, but then the Pentecostal brethren would think that you can get it back again you don't get born again again. You're born again once as a sinner, and Amen. that's all it takes. Amen. But uh, so you don't lose it and get born again again. You know, if this always amazed me, the Pentecostal brethren, and by the way, when I say brethren, I mean that in the most sincere way. I have had some great friends who are of the Assemblies of God persuasion or the Church of God persuasion, even the four square denomination who love the Lord Jesus Christ, they've trusted Him as their Savior and trusted in His work alone to save them. Uh, their names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. They just don't enjoy the security that they ought to enjoy as a believer. Um, and because of that insecurity, they tend to be very shallow in their understanding of the Scriptures. That's why they buy into these things like, well, you have to speak in tongues or maybe get slain in the Spirit or maybe have the gift of prophecy and and declare the future over somebody else's life, uh, and a number of things. 
But um, so they, they always believe that you lose your salvation, but you can get saved again. How is it, though, that when someone ostensibly in that situation loses their salvation and supposedly gets it again at a Pentecostal uh, altar call, how is it that that person doesn't have to get baptized as a new believer all over again? They never talk about that. That never enters into it. But um, uh, when I was working for Chick Publications, there was a lady working there who was of a Pentecostal background. And she said to my friend Mark Randolph, are you Baptist? Do you believe once saved, always saved? And he said, oh, no, no, we don't believe that at all. We believe once born, always born. There it is. She didn't know what to say to that. <clears throat> Answer a fool according to his folly, lest thou uh, be like him. But uh, clearly, to taste means to die, and uh, you experience it. Uh, the truth is, this part of the book of Hebrews is only going to make sense if you put the application, the fulfillment, into the future, to someone beyond the church age. And let's consider what the scriptures before us actually reveal. First of all, the reader, or whoever Paul's writing to, is a Hebrew. Secondly, he's a Hebrew who is saved. Thirdly, he's in danger of losing it, losing his salvation, if he doesn't endure to the end, according to Matthew 24, and uh, if he doesn't hold fast his profession uh, without wavering. Hebrews 4:14. 4, and also Hebrews 10, verse 23. Only by doing this, holding fast, can he become a partaker of Christ, as chapter 3, verse 14 states it. Even though he is already said to have been a partaker of the Holy Ghost here in this section. That's awkward language to some degree. The man in question has tasted the powers of a world to come, which will be characterized by signs and wonders. You recall, like, right after the, uh, the Lord Jesus ascended, the Holy Ghost came upon the disciples in Acts chapter 2. The first seven chapters of, Acts, of the book of Acts are full of miracles, Peter and John healing the uh, crippled man outside the temple, and so forth. And uh, then Stephen's... Uh, testimony in Acts chapter 7 um, and the Jews still rejecting it rejecting Christ as their Messiah and as their Savior I was with a bunch of uh, Messianic Jews earlier this week I was assigned to go work a funeral service at the National Cemetery and the rabbi uh, Sid Kim was going to come and conduct he's a guy half Korean half Hawaiian, uh, Dutch, uh, Indonesian, uh, Filipino, whatever else he was. But uh, he looked more like a Hispanic man than anything else. But um, so he, he's the, the leader of this Messianic Jewish congregation that meets in Rancho Cucamonga. And uh, I was delighted to learn that the deceased was a Messianic. He was actually uh, born to missionaries. His parents lived in Lagos, Nigeria when he was born 72 years ago and uh, spent the first 12, 13 years of his life growing up in Africa to missionary parents and had a tremendous testimony of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and um, but then had gravitated to want to know more about the Jews and a Messianic synagogue so they worship on Saturday as Jews do but they are Jews largely who, who believe in Christ as their Messiah and want to worship him in a Jewish way. Uh, my suspicion, however, is that most people in Messianic synagogues today are simply Christians curious about Judaism. Most of them were never Jews to start with. Um, clearly the rabbi wasn't Jewish, wasn't raised Jewish, but... Um, he nevertheless wore the yarmulke and put on a prayer shawl before he began his, not even orthodox or reformed rabbis 
of where prayer shawl when they conduct their services these days. I've seen them. So, uh, so these are largely Christians who appreciate the history of, it, of the Jews in the Bible and the future of the Jews in the Bible. And they want to worship God in a Jewish way and observe the uh, Passover, the Seder, uh, the way Jews would normally do. Um, and I suppose the, ver the, the verdict is still not in yet as to whether that's what God would want Christians to do. Because the Lord Jesus didn't establish uh, messianic synagogues, he established a New Testament church made of Gentiles and Jews. But uh, be that as it was, it was delightful to see that uh, he had requested a star of David be put on his gravestone with the cross in the middle, indicating he was a, a Jew, or at least he was a, a messianic worshiper of Jesus Christ. Anyway, Consider the signs and the miracles that were manifested uh, among the believing Jews in the first seven chapters of Acts as a testimony to the unbelieving Jews. And, uh, but they ended up rejecting Christ as a whole anyway. Go, if you will, back to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17 and let's start there at verse 10. Matthew 17 and verses 10 through 13. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must come first? That's Elijah. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. They had already resisted the forerunner of Christ, John the Baptist, who Christ likened to Elijah coming before the second advent, before his second coming, and um, in the book of Malachi, which we, we already consulted back in Malachi chapter 4. And uh, there's a warning to all those about the, the possible curse of God, if they fall away from Jesus Christ. Um, point number six, the man in our text is in danger of drawing back into perdition, just like the Jews who actually got into the promised land under Joshua and then apostatized against God after they were in the promised land. We read about that in, in Judges chapters 1, 2, and 3. And God begins to institute, uh, or to introduced judges among the people who were, would be the highest authority to give the words of God to the people. And uh, some of those were met with bad uh, fortunes by those who hated them as well. And uh, the man can lose salvation. He can be unable to get it back again, as verses 4, 5, and 6 declare. And when he does lose it, a burning awaits him at the second advent because he will be judged as one of God's people. Look forward at Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. And let's start at verse 26. Now here's the book of Hebrews, written by a believing Hebrew to Hebrews, so the audience is going to be Hebrews, Jews. Verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy, under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall it be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. So, 
Verse 29 there, I've used in talking to somebody, I talked to a Jehovah Witness about that, and he said the idea that hell would be eternal uh, because someone just simply didn't believe in Jesus. And I said, hell is not uh, eternal because of how wicked you might have been. Hell is eternal because of how perfect Jesus Christ was and is. If he was the eternal Son of God and you rejected him, nothing less than eternal punishment for that is, is uh, proper or sufficient. And I, so, I pointed verse 28 at how, of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall they be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and put and, dis, and done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So hell is not eternal because of how bad you were. And I'll grant you some people were worse than others. Some people that go through life with a pretty decent conscience and they're not looking to hurt other people. But if without Jesus Christ, they're still lost. Amen. Other people go through life trying to hurt other people, trying to do bad, raising as much hell as they can raise, uh, and they die and they're lost. So I'll grant you some people uh, are worse than other people. But both die without Jesus Christ. Both are going to suffer for eternity. And because hell, eternal punishment has nothing to do with how bad you were. It has to do with how perfect he was, how perfect he is, and will always be. And you said, I don't want him. Yeah. That's why your punishment is going to be eternal. So you can apply that text that way to somebody. But someone who falls away from the faith uh, in the tribulation is going to receive the judgment of Jesus Christ when he comes back at the end of the tribulation. And particularly those uh, who are Jews, Hebrews, called God's people. Uh, there's one thing about the tribulation. Read Daniel's 70th week, book of Daniel, and Matthew 24, and uh, the, the, the general epistles, starting with Hebrews all the way through the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the last nine books in the New Testament, uh, ultimately, doctrinally, are intended for somebody left behind after the rapture who can trust Christ by faith to be saved, but if he doesn't maintain good works, he is then in danger of losing it. Yeah. That's not the way it is right now. Thank you, Lord. I'm saved right now. My name's already in, the, in heaven, and there's already a mansion waiting for me. I'm waiting for this body to be changed and catch up with it, so my transformation will be complete. But, um, but not so in the tribulation. Now, go forward to the book of Revelation, and we'll finish for today. Revelation 12. No matter how many spiritual applications are made to this section for the devotional comfort of a New Testament Christian now, you can't put this passage to rest until you run it up past the church age and into the tribulation, and apply it to Jews in the tribulation. Revelation 12, verse 17 there says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, that will be Israel, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. There's your good deeds and your works. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There is faith. Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. There's your works. And the faith of Jesus. There's your faith. Look up there at Revelation 14 and begin at verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So that sounds like somebody who falls away 
from his faith in Christ and his desire to do good works to maintain it. Here is where James 2.24 comes in. Um, so then uh, you see that a man is justified uh, by works and not by faith alone. Faith and works. All the cults misapply that verse to say salvation right now is based upon initial faith and works. They get something out of its proper place. And that contradicts what the Apostle Paul says, not, uh, by, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And uh, also in the book of Romans he says the same things. So the final interpretation for our sake is this section, Hebrews chapter 6, is not, you can do your best to make some devotional application to a Christian who should stay faithful to God, and not lose hope, not lose faith, not lose uh, heart, because life gets rough. Um, but the ultimate application is going to have to be somebody in the tribulation who has believed on Christ by faith, uh, and then falls away and knows, no longer wants to live for Christ and endure to the end in order to get into the kingdom age and be received by Christ. If he falls away somewhere before the tribulation is over, he loses whatever standing he had with God and um, he's then judged and burned and cursed as the scriptures warn against. And that's about the best way you can apply this section here uh, otherwise, you run into all sorts of arguments with people who say, well, uh, someone loses their salvation, and you point out, yeah, but the same text says you can't get it back again. So it's got to be somebody not in the church, but somebody in some other uh, dispensation of time. 